Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Welcome to an update. I'm Michael J. I'm Colin Jost. Judge Brett Kavanaugh and Dr. Christine Blasey Ford appeared Thursday in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee in a classic debate of she said, he yelled. Based on his testimony, I guess Kavanaugh thought the hearing was about whether he was cool in high school. I drank beer. I liked beer. Still like beer. I worked out with other guys at Tobin's house just to meet up and have some beers. Working out, lifting weights, we drank beer, we liked beer. I gotta say, you're not really helping yourself in a drunken assault case when you yell about how much you like drinking and how strong you were at the time. Pretty much the only ones who kept their composure at the hearing were the woman being questioned and the woman Republicans had to hire to talk to the woman being questioned. Now, on an optics level, I get why the Republicans did that, but if you're not the right person to ask questions at a Senate hearing, maybe you're not the right person to be a senator. I just want to remind everybody that all this yelling and crying happened at this dude's job interview. I mean, typically when you're asked about a sexual assault and your drinking problem at a job interview, you don't get the damn job. I don't know if Mr. Kavanaugh actually has a history of assault or if he actually has a drinking problem, but I do know that he might. And you shouldn't be on the Supreme Court if you might. You shouldn't be on the People's Court if you might. Sometimes might is enough. I mean, I don't want to pet your dog if he might bite me. I don't want to leave you in my house if you might be a crackhead. I'm not going to have sex with you if you might have dated Charlie Sheen. And then there are his calendars. Uh, You know, if you have calendars from 1982, it does not prove you're innocent. It proves you're a hoarder. You know when most people throw out their calendars from 1982? 1983. And if you're drinking a bunch and you keep a calendar, it's probably to help piece together what happened in your life. He kept a calendar the same way the guy in Memento got tattoos. Now, to be fair to Judge Kavanaugh, it's insane that Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, one guy. To be fair to Judge Kavanaugh, it's insane that he has to answer questions about his high school yearbook. If you looked into anyone's high school yearbook, you'd find something super embarrassing. Like, I regret that my senior quote was a Smash Mouth lyric. And I very much regret that my hairstyle was the Rachel. But if they do ask about your yearbook, why would you lie? The Devil's Triangle is not a drinking game. But speaking of drinking games, if you took a shot for every time Kavanaugh lied about his yearbook, you'd be as drunk as Brett Kavanaugh was in the summer of 82. You know, these hearings have taught me a lot about what happens at white prep schools. And I never thought I'd say this, but I'm sending my kids to a black school where it's safe. You know, of course, this is a big deal because a Supreme Court judge is a lifetime job. And sadly, that's more important to Congress than the concerns of half the country. Kavanaugh could be the deciding vote on issues concerning the very people he makes feel unsafe. It'd be like letting a coyote decide on roadrunner rights or letting all white cops police an all black neighborhood. (laughs) Also, (laughs) why does it have to be him? You can't just pick another dude from your Illuminati lizard meetings. 
Are Republicans so pro-life that you don't even have a plan B for this? And now, President Trump on Friday ordered the FBI to conduct a new investigation into Brett Kavanaugh. And Trump is so serious, he said the FBI should probably just drop everything else and only investigate this one thing. Because after Dr. Ford's testimony... (laughs) After Dr. Ford's testimony and this new FBI investigation, Kavanaugh basically has two strikes against him. Or as Kavanaugh thinks of it, Dos Equis. It is Tuesday, the 2nd of October of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. That's right, folks. Leave the old bay in the cupboard. You've heard me mention it before. A little smidgen of Hungarian hot paprika is all you need in this dish. A smidgen. A little less than a dash. Okay. Though some people can take a dash of the Hungarian hot paprika, even the smoked kind, which is good. But leave the Old Bay in the uh, cupboard because uh, that's only good for the clam bake. Okay, I know people put in other things, but trust me, have it for the clam bake. Well, well, well. It's interesting how comedy can be a lot more serious about the issues of the day than the actual news. And I just had to uh, use that clip from Saturday Night Live here last and uh, their weekend update because I think that that basically is really the best serious argument for why Kavanaugh has to go. And uh, uh, there's more. It's not just women. More women coming out of the woodwork. It's everything coming out of the woodwork. And uh, now a lot of things are getting shaken out also just in the whole, the whole scheme of what it is to be a member of the GOP. And I'm looking at you, Mitch McConnell. When the Nuremberg, Pennsylvania trials are happening, I, I really think that... Uh, you're not just going to be questioned. I think you will be charged. Yeah, in uh, 2016, uh, CIA and a few other people came to Mitch McConnell with their hair on fire. Remember that from 9-11 way back? Came in with their hair on fire about Russians involving themselves in our political process. And Mitch McConnell shut it down because he looked to gain from Russian involvement in our political process. He being, he and the political party that he is leading. What kind of person thinks like that? A hostile foreign power offers help in our political process to a political party and the leader of that political party says, yeah. And any investigations by our intelligence communities, our law enforcement communities, is put by the wayside, shut down. Sounds to me like that's an accomplice to, you you can call it what you want. What's on the rest of the menu? I mean, there's so much news, but I had to curate a story for you today, and the story has a flow to it. Every day, every dish has, has a theme. And we try to we try to give a flow. Yeah. That's true. A meal is like a story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. All right, on the rest of the menu, you know Rachel Mitchell, the uh prosecutor that was uh persecuting Dr. Ford? <laughs> yeah. Well, she was spotted laughing and tossing back beers with Grassley staff the night. After the Kavanaugh, Ford hearing ended. Interesting that. Trump Cabinet Secretary Elaine Chao logged 290 hours, that's about seven weeks, of mysterious private time 
in her first 14 months heading the transportation department. What was she doing? And the GOP cuts off funding for another House incumbent in a deep red state. Yeah, it's a blue tsunami warning. After the break, we then move to the chef's table, where Eric Reed gave NFL reporters a lesson on 400 years of systemic oppression. And weeks after a series of violent far-right rallies rocked the city of Chemnitz, German authorities have uncovered a neo-Nazi terrorist cell targeting foreigners and politicians. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice a uh, some scrolling there as the page loads, and those are links in which you can determine whether you are registered to vote or not, and also a link in which you can register to vote. We only have 35 more days, all right? So uh, get ready. All right, and please do. Make sure you register to vote. They will pull out all the stops, and, and and they're doing it right now. So be careful and do vote. At the bottom of our homepage, at netrootsradio.com, you will notice then the chat room link at the right of the page, monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Check out her shows on Saturday. At the Table with Kelly Lincoln begins at 3 p.m. on the West Coast. That would be 6 p.m. on the East Coast. And then later on, she teams up with Ricky for the Round Table Roundhouse Power Hour. And they command that hour beginning at 9 p.m. on the West Coast, midnight on the East Coast. And it's for an hour because it's a power hour. They pack it all in. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the Contribute button, and that is deftly located uh, to entice you possibly to become a Patreon of Netroots Radio. Uh, we are Resistance Radio. We pay our bills. It's one way we can stay under the radar and continue resisting, so your generosity keeps the lights a-blinking in their proper order on the modem, and we are truly unable to do this without you. Thank you for your generosity. You can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. We are on Facebook. And you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And uh, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And I am there, of course, as Justice Putnam because that's me. I didn't make up this name. It was, it was uh, well, anointed, shall I say. And uh, you can follow the show on Facebook at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. On Twitter, you'll have to find us at Cookbook West. Pick up the podcasts of the show by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, iTunes, YouTube, etc., etc., etc. Before we get right into everything here, uh, I'd like to... Uh, Wish my son a very, 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 very happy birthday. Yes, you're 41. And I remember that day uh, as if it was only yesterday, because that's what happens when you get old. And I remember how you barely fit in my hands. You were so small. I had the great fortune and honor to be able to be present when my son was born. Uh, which was quite new at the time. You almost had to get an act of Congress to be able to get in there. And we'd gone through, really, the first generation of Lamaze classes. And uh, so I utilized that. Plus, I grew up on a farm. You know, we uh, 
we birthed all sorts of mammals there. So it wasn't a mysterious process. But the bonding aspect, I, I never realized how, how profound that would be. And uh, I, was, I, I still look at, at that day as a great honor to be present at my son's birth. So happy birthday, son. And uh, here's a big virtual hug for you. In the summertime, they ride outside. Get your ball on clear. All the hoes is dropping, niggas start blocking. I know my game is popping. In the 503. Sexy there, sexy there. Get the trapping, we party happen. No fear, sexy there. In the summer, catch me rolling with your baby mama in the Bahamas. Exactly. Roller skating limited, we play for keys equipment for the Bonnie O'Dane with heat. Fry your brakes to the beat, listen close, strap your seatbelt and sneak a toe. Take a sip of that drink, where you headed to the bar, you what you think. I'm half an hour late, took her to work and hit the bank. A player with show and needed some dank. AC on, buzzing good from the drink. Grab my slip and continue on my trip, no time to slide, I'm dipping in the wind. Flip forward about 10, sunset, big rest. I'm right next to a bad red bone in the leg. She see the place, it's a trap. Make no mistake, you DA double disease. Hogs, busters can't see. Me through the weed, fall red light, drop the limo tent. Pounding like a pet, she hunkin' and jockin' on the first hit. Green, I hit the skirt, she jump out in front of a player. Bleak the arm, in the summertime, we zone. Pullin' pros, in 503, Valley of Area Coast. Bittin' venom at these hoes, and all the talent goes. In the summertime, we ride outside. Get your ball on, player. Cause the hoes is jockin', niggas caught blockin'. I know my game is poppin', in the 503. Sexy there, sexy there. In the summer comes play ball and shot call and get drawn and banging off the wall and people call me little baby. But first they're breezy, taking off their head and trying to make it real busy. But a new time, I'm going to get my bullet in the sunshine. So sometimes, on the block with dogs, get you in the thing about your neck hat. Yeah, beat the front back, make it have a heart attack. You can bet on that back, that's a fact. Boy, Mac, bitch, trying to get rich, tighten up my shit. This game, I'm so get the dope, end up, blow it. Best we roll it, tuck it on gold and then it. You got shit, get your dash on, plus just trying to hurt. Get your mask on, trying to get my cash on. My nigga Marcus in the back with a mask on, can't help it. It's Self-evident, my game is heavy, it really is, but at all, I'm trying to tell y'all, we 50 trap dogs, y'all cause it may have five or three, where I'm from, trying to get some, straight back to Salem, what was, give me, get him a, a piece of pie, before I die, I'm a ride your block, count chips as big as well, still, have a sit in air belt, won't make my hair swell, let a brother live well, don't party in hotel, burn hay belt, they shake their body, throwing it knotted, at a dog, they look at Flossy, in the summertime, in the summertime, we ride outside, get your ball on, play. That was uh, my son's group, 50 Tramp Dog, I, and that was a song called Summertime, which I have used a few snippets here and there to uh, to uh, add some liveliness to the radio station for stingers and whatnot, and that's off of a, a CD from a few years ago. So happy birthday, son. This uh, first article here is out of Raw Story. And um, by uh, Bob Brigham. And it doesn't really have a good look. Uh, this report that Rachel Mitchell submitted in which uh, she uh, specifies quite succinctly that uh, Dr. Ford is basically a witch who probably hypnotized herself into believing that she had been sexually abused by really a pillar of the community. When I say pillar, I mean, yeah, a pillar. Oh, my God. And uh, she didn't like the uh, answers that uh, Dr. Ford gave her. And, of course, there is no mention of Kavanaugh in her report. And uh, so she said that, uh, you know, what she's got, she could not bring uh, rape charges against Kavanaugh. Well, that's not what 
that whole questioning was about. He was applying for a job. Well, uh, she knew what she was there for. A uh, DA who works or has worked in that office, who I believe was trained by her, said that, you know, the questions that she asked was exactly the questions that he was told not to ever use in a sexual abuse case. But tribal alliances and I got to tell you, maybe a few bucks go a long way in determining what your morality and ethics are. Sex crimes prosecutor hired by the Senate Judiciary Committee to interrogate. I would say it was an inquisition. Dr. Christine Blasey Ford went out drinking with Republican operatives working for Senator Chuck Grassley on Friday. Maricopa County, Arizona prosecutor Rachel Mitchell was hired by Senate Republicans to question Ford, who has accused Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault and attempted rape when she was a 15-year-old high school student. Well, as if none of us know that, but there's a few that don't. Republicans ended Mitchell's role when she began to question Kavanaugh and began pointing out inconsistencies in his testimony. Yeah, specifically the July 1st entry, in which they're going to a party, exactly like the one Dr. Ford uh, described. The day after the hearing, Mitchell was in good spirits while celebrating with Grassley's staff. She was laughing and tossing back beers with Grassley's staff at Union Pub on Friday. Bassett tweeted on Monday. She knows who she works for. And uh, after having drinks with Grassley's staff, Mitchell then sent Judiciary Republicans that five-page memo claiming a reasonable prosecutor would not pursue Ford's case. Eric Ballard brings us this next offering here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy's Bistro Cafe. Hey, our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, just so you know. All right. Well, uh, Elaine Chow has taken the equivalent of seven weeks of vacation in what she called private meetings. Now, of course, we all know Elaine Chow. She's the transportation secretary. And we also know Elaine Chow as, I don't know, maybe she doesn't want to be known as this, but she could also be known as uh, Mrs. Mitch McConnell. Uh Uh-huh. Transportation secretary. Do you know that her family is one of the richest families in the world? They, They... are big uh, Chinese shipping magnets. So she would know about transportation because they transport and have been accused of transporting uh, illegal drugs and other nefarious products uh, quite often. Well, she's already put in nearly 300 hours of private time while serving as a cabinet member. The highly unusual practice raises all sorts of questions about how Chow is spending her time as a taxpayer-paid public official. Well, she doesn't really need the salary, but she'll take it, as long as they can take money from those people over there and put it in their pockets. In total, Chow clocked more than 290 hours of appointments labeled private, the equivalent of about seven weeks vacation during her first 14 months in Trump's cabinet based on a review of documents provided under a Freedom of Information Act, and that's a report by Politico. There's a suspicion that Chow just isn't working that hard as she constantly flips up her Friday afternoon schedules with private time meetings. Either that, or Chow and her office are purposely trying to hide from the public what she's doing as Secretary of Transportation. I think private time might be on Fridays when she gets the facial before she and Mitch go out to all of the D.C. Uh, uh, you know parties and stuff that they are uh, well expected to show up for. 
If Chow was regularly checking out early on Friday afternoons, she would be mirroring, mirroring the light work schedule of her boss. Trump typically doesn't start his work day until 11 after he's taken advantage of three hours of executive time, which usually means watching Fox News. Chow's office insists the unknown private time blocks of time uh, listed on her day-to-day calendars are used to conceal Chow's travel plans for security reasons or because they're, or because she's doing things like meeting with personal friends, going to the doctor, or having lunch with her husband. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. And that's a lot of lunches and friend meetups. Okay. Well, former Department of Transportation officials tell Politico, the endless private events don't add up. It certainly appears that they have just tried to over-redact meetings. They would prefer the public not to know about. What is Elaine Chow hiding? Also of Share Blue Media brings us this last offering here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy's Bistro Cafe. Looks like Republicans are abandoning their own House members ahead of the midterms, and uh, probably not a moment too soon. In the past few weeks, Republicans have cut off funding for several incumbent House members in tough races, effectively waving a white flag at the impending blue wave. It could be a tsunami. On Sunday, The Hill reported that National Republican Campaign Committee has canceled nearly a $1 million ad buy in support of Representative Kevin Yoder, repug of Kansas, who won re-election in 2016 by double digits. Democratic challenger Sharice Davids currently leads Yoder in the polls, and the race is rated as a toss-up by the Cook Political Report. Meanwhile, Political reported that the Congressional Leadership Fund, a GOP super PAC, has cut off support for two more incumb- incumbents, Michigan Representative Mike Bishop and Colorado Representative Mike Kaufman. Well, get rid of the mics. Uh, that's dropping the mic. Mic drop. The PAC has canceled over $3 million in planned ad buys between the two. And just days before that, They also cancel the remainder of its ads. Now, this is the NRCC of its ad for Representative Keith Rothfuss, a repug of Pennsylvania, running against Representative Connor Lamb, who pulled off a stunning upset victory in a March special election. Because of gerrymandering, the two congressmen are now running against each other in the new 17th congressional district. All four of uh, the incumbents easily won their re-election in 2016, some by double digits, but are now locked in close contests with with Democratic opponents. And there might be more bad news from battled incumbents to come. There could be a much, there could be a bunch more. A former NRCC staffer told the Hill, "If you have a race that's just not winnable and you have limited resources, you can't spend just to make somebody feel better." Democrats have flipped dozens of red seats to blue in special elections since Trump was inaugurated and overperforming even in races that they've lost. One recent forecast shows Democrats picking up 60 House seats in November. I would say don't get complacent. We need more. Okay. We need to work hard for even more. If that's the case, shifting funds away from a handful of races might not be enough for Republicans to save their majority. 
only if we keep working hard and not get complacent. All right, let's get to our break. And when we come back, we will go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. The main practical application of CPA so far has been in the eye surgery. It was the first one, and I think it is the one that is used by most people for something practical. Donna Strickland, on the phone this morning with Jorn Hansen of the Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute, after learning that she had shared the Nobel Prize in physics. CPA is chirped pulse amplification, a technique for producing incredibly short pulses of laser light of very high intensity. A few minutes before talking with Strickland, Hansen made the announcement. This year's prize is about tools made from light. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics with one half to Arthur Ashkin for the optical tweezers and their application to biological systems. And the other half, jointly to Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland for their method of generating high-intensity, ultra-short optical pulses. Uh, Arthur Ashkin was born in 1922 in New York City. He made his remarkable invention at the Bell Laboratories in New Jersey in the United States. Gérard Mourou was born in 1944 in Albertville in France, and he is currently at the École Polytechnique in Palais Sceau in France, and also affiliated with the University of Michigan in the United States. Donna Strickland was born in 1959 in Gulf, Ontario, Canada, and she's currently at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Dr. Mourou and Strickland did much of their groundbreaking work together at the University of Rochester in the United States. Physicist Olga Botner, chair of the Nobel Committee for Physics, added, Today we celebrate two inventions within the field of laser physics that have opened new scientific vistas, but what's more, have already led to applications of direct benefit to society. Optical tweezers allowing control of tiny living organisms and an amplification technique enabling construction of high-intensity, compact laser systems. For an in-depth listen about the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics, look for the Scientific American Science Talk podcast later today. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. The White House on Monday authorized the FBI to interview any witnesses it deems necessary in its probe of the sexual misconduct allegations against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, loosening tight restrictions that had been imposed earlier. A new report says that Kavanaugh's legal team reportedly texted with his college friends to undercut classmate Deborah Ramirez's allegations of sexual misconduct before she went public in The New Yorker. The messages, summarized in a memo obtained by NBC, suggest that Kavanaugh's relationship with Ramirez was closer than he let on and that she was uncomfortable around him when they were both at a wedding 10 years after they graduated. NBC's Heidi Presbola has more. She is a mutual friend of both Debbie Ramirez and Brett Kavanaugh, who knew them from their days at Yale University. She is in possession of a series of text messages that she says she has not drawn any conclusions about, but that suggests 
suggest that they definitely need to investigate further what was going on in the lead up to this New Yorker piece exposing uh, Debbie Ramirez's story. Specifically, uh, she wanted to get out these texts that show that Kavanaugh may have been trying to discredit Debbie Ramirez in the run up to the New Yorker story running, even though he told the Senate Judiciary Committee that he wasn't aware of the New Yorker huh. story until it ran. So that's something that needs to be looked into, whether he was pushing other classmates who are part of this tight knit circle that includes Debbie Ramirez and the lady who <laughs> crafted this memo. Her name, by the way, is Carrie Bertram. She is 51 years old, former classmate who has been concerned for quite a while trying to bring this information forward. The White House says that this is normal, that Kavanaugh would do this in the run up to this story, that it's PR 101. The woman who exchanged the text messages with another friend had text messages saying that Brett is asking me to do this. Brett's team is asking me to do this, including procuring a photo of Debbie Ramirez and Brett later that shows them smiling at a bridal party. Well, guess what? Another thing that we obtained in these text messages suggests that Debbie Ramirez was actually very uncomfortable during that interaction in that photo that was taken at a wedding of a mutual friend. According to these text messages, Carrie Bertram says that she thought it was very odd how Debbie Ramirez was behaving at this party, that she was avoiding Brett Kavanaugh, that Deborah Ramirez was clinging to Carrie Burcham. Regardless of what the FBI investigation turns up, Mitch McConnell said on the Senate floor Monday that a vote on Kavanaugh's confirmation would be held this week. The time for endless delay and obstruction has come to a close. Judge Kavanaugh's nomination is out of committee. We're considering it here on the floor, and Mr. President will be voting this week. Donald Trump on Monday announced that NAFTA is dead and a new U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade deal will take its place. Just today we made history again when I announced to the world that we are replacing the job-killing disaster known as NAFTA with a brand new U.S.-Mexico-Canada. We added Canada, worked out great. Trade agreement. And we're calling it USMCA, no more NAFTA. President Trump rolled out this new trade agreement with Canada and Mexico today, intended, as you heard there, to take the place of NAFTA. At what was intended to be a victory lap ceremony, that White House Rose Garden event, the president boasted the deal will, quote, transform North America back into a manufacturing powerhouse. Trump also defended his aggressive trade policies, claiming those tactics led to this win. Without tariffs, we wouldn't be talking about a deal. Just for those babies out there that keep talking about tariffs, that includes Congress. Oh, please don't charge tariffs. Without tariffs, you wouldn't be, we wouldn't be standing here. Despite today's fanfare, the original NAFTA remains in effect until the new deal can be approved by the legislature's of all three countries. After the announcement in the Rose Garden, Trump said he'd take some questions. He called on ABC's Cecilia Vega. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. She's shocked that I picked her. No. She's in a state of shock. I'm not thinking, Mr. That's President. That's okay. I know you're not thinking. You never do. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, he really did tell ABC's White House reporter Cecilia Vega that she's not thinking. She never does. He also refused to take a question from CNN's Caitlin Collins. Thank you, Mr. President. Now that you've answered several questions on trade, I'd like to turn uh, don't, don't, to don't Judge do that. Kavanaugh. Don't do, do you have, do you have uh, excuse me, do you have a question on trade? We'll we do just, one or two more questions on trade. You answered several questions okay, on trade. Okay, don't do that. That's not nice. Mr. President, and besides that, the, somebody is before you. Excuse me. Don't do that. Do you have a question on trade? You answered several questions on trade. Do you have a trade? question on trade? My question is on Judge Okay, Kavanaugh. please, yes. You said please. the FBI should interview whoever that they believe is appropriate. Does that include Julie Swetnick, the third accuser? And can you promise to release the full findings oh, give me your from the question, after they finish their report, Mr. President? Give me your question, please. Give her the mic, please. One might get the impression that Trump has a problem with women. Hmm. In other news that we need to keep in mind, over the past two weeks, hundreds of migrant children have been taken from shelters and sent to a tent city in Tornillo, Texas, this according to the New York Times, in what experts are calling a humanitarian crisis of the U.S. government's own making. And that's a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and The Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is fully listener-supported, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com slash donate.
you can help stop the Trump agenda in its tracks. Make sure you're registered to vote. Go to rockthevote.org. And on November 6th, vote for Democrats up and down the ticket. This message, a public service from all the fine people of netrootsradio.com. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor special report recorded on Tuesday, October 2nd, 2018. I'm Mark Belanger. And what I'm thrilled about this deal is we actually talk about people. We spent a lot of time talking about Canadian workers, American workers, Mexican workers. That is Jerry Diaz, the president of the Canadian Union, Unifor, as news was announced that the United States, Canada, and Mexico have agreed on a new trade deal. He was speaking to a media conference carried by the CTV television network. Unifor represents thousands of auto workers in Canada. U.S. President Donald Trump was threatening to put a 25% tariff on Canadian-produced cars. If approved by the three national legislatures, the deal will replace the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. The new deal is called the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement, USMCA. Today is a great day for Canadians. Obviously, you're well aware that we came to an agreement with the United States on the renegotiations of a new NAFTA deal. The number one export industry in the country is the auto industry. And I am absolutely thrilled that we were able to, A, put into place a format that will lead to investment in Canada, continued investment in Canada, but as important, getting rid of the absolute threat of the 25% tariff uh, that the Donald Trump administration has been threatening for quite a while. If you take a look at the overall deal, we really did meet the major objectives, and it was about solidifying the footprint. Um, ensuring that uh, the jobs were not going to continue to bleed and go to, uh, to, to Mexico. If you take a look at what has transpired over the last 24 years, in the original NAFTA, we had a trade surplus in manufacturing. Today, we have a $120 billion deficit. Why? Because of the low wages in Mexico, the corrupt structure that they have in Mexico. But all of that has been fixed. But other huge victories today is the fact that Canada was able to wrestle back the clause that really talked about energy ratcheting, which gave the United States more access, frankly, to our oil reserves than we had more control. So that issue has been resolved, which is such a major, major victory for Canadians. We were able to make sure that the dispute mechanism within the original NAFTA agreement is preserved so that we can have a fair adjudication process in our disputes with the United States. The whole cultural exemption is in place which really prevented the United States from really taking control of the media sector here in Canada. So if I'm a worker today in the media sector, the auto sector, so many manufacturing sectors, I'm feeling a lot more comfortable today than I have over the last 24, 25 years because the government was absolutely able to reach consensus, to come to an agreement on things that were very, very important to Canadians. And what I'm thrilled about this deal is we actually talked about people. We spent a lot of time talking about Canadian workers, American workers, Mexican workers. The Labour chapter goes a long way in alleviating so much of what's been wrong with the original NAFTA. So am I comfortable? The answer is yes. Is it a perfect deal? The answer is no. But are we better off today than we have been over the last 24 years? I'll say emphatically the answer is yes. The people of Canada were your union members. You would recommend. Uh, you would recommend. I would recommend the approval of this deal. Absolutely. This is. It's not perfect, and nor will I ever profess it to be. But have we come a long way? The answer is yes. Did we really plug a lot of the holes that have existed for 24 years? The answer is yes. We got rid of the ISDS clause. The investor. So that's gone. That in itself is a huge hallmark. Look, if I'm looking at this from a progressive point of view, there are huge victories. Number one, the whole ISDS clause, the investor clause that allows corporations to sue our government is gone. If I take a look at the whole energy ratcheting clause that gave the United States, frankly, preference as it relates to our oil and energy sector, that's gone. Um, If I take a look at the potential of the auto tariffs, that's gone. So there are some incredible victories in this deal 
things that we've been arguing and fighting for for the last 24 years. And that's it. International labor news you can use. I'm Mark Belanche. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. Voters in Macedonia backed a proposal Sunday to change their country's name in a move that could help end the country's long-running diplomatic dispute with Greece. Greece contends the Republic of Macedonia's existing name falsely implies control over several Greek provinces as well as connections to the ancient Macedon Empire. To force Macedonia's hand, Greek leaders have thwarted their neighbors' efforts to join NATO and the European Union until the name dispute is resolved. After decades of talks, the leaders of both countries agreed in June that a new name, the Republic of North Macedonia, would settle the matter, and Macedonia's prime minister eagerly put the name change to a vote. If you look at the results of this referendum, which striking over 91% voting yes and a voter turnout around 37%. So there's a little bit of countervailing forces. Damon Wilson is the executive vice president of the Atlantic Council. I think the referendum result sort of demonstrates, you know, dramatically deep support for Macedonia being embedded in the institutions of the transatlantic community. The challenge is with this turnout. For Macedonian law, turnout below 50% means the referendum isn't legally binding, leaving it to lawmakers to interpret the will of the people. Prime Minister Zoran Zaev is vowing to go ahead with the name change, and the U.S. is cheering him on, eager to see some more NATO enlargement. But Wilson says ending the Macedonian naming issue is about more than geopolitics. This is about the story of unfinished business. This is still part of the fracturing of the global order post-89 and the consequences from the fall of Berlin Wall, the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia. Until we have certainty in how the dust settles, if you will, there is a possibility of volatility, uncertainty, and at a minimum, it leads to real limits on the economic possibilities of the people that are impacted. Luke Vargas, the United Nations. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays. Just a smidgen, a little smidgen of smoked hot Hungarian paprika is really, really all you need. All right. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 58 degrees. And it has been raining. A little light rain right now, just or just uh, a few minutes ago, uh, went, went uh, even lighter and it's just a mere mist right now. But we expect more rain during the day, or through more rain in the morning. It'll be tapering off uh, uh, later on this afternoon, and then clearing late. Right now, winds are out of the east-northeast, about uh, 1 to 2 miles per hour. Will remain light and variable uh, through the night until tomorrow where they will then shift out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Uh, Continuing to have a a chance of rain through the night and even less tomorrow, high of 73 today, overnight low of 74, I'm sorry, overnight low of 54. And then tomorrow we're looking at uh, a high in the mid-70s. Looks like there's quite a bit of rain cells in the area, uh, according to the radar satellite maps. 
And ragweed pollen is now down to moderate. Air quality index is in the good range and has dropped to 29. And that daytime UV index is still in the moderate range, but it dropped uh, over the weekend as well to 4. Uh, barometric pressure is holding steady at 29.79 inches. Visibility is down to 7 miles. And relative humidity is 87%. Okay, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchase. These people planted. These purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 68 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 60 and cloudy. Rome is 74 and cloudy. Kiev is 61 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 71 and fair, which is bad if you're having a wedding party. Stay inside. Don't announce it. You'll live longer. Hong Kong is 75 and clear. Tokyo is 67 and fair. Sydney, Australia is 60 degrees and fair. San Francisco, California is 61 degrees with light rain. And New York, New York is 72 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Gibbs brings us this first offering here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Last Thursday, a month into the NFL season, the Carolina Panthers signed free agent safety Eric Reed, a former pro bowler who gained notoriety when he became the first player to join his then-teammate, Colin Kaepernick, in taking a knee during the national anthem to protest police brutality and systemic racism. I should interject, there was somewhat of an argument over the weekend uh, with my Trump bro, who uh, extolled the virtues of Tim Tebow as being the first person to ever take a knee at a football game, but he was doing it for our Lord Christ and not to, uh, to uh, be traitors against our flag and the country. And I, I once again explained to him that it's not about uh, uh, protesting the flag it is about drawing attention to systemic racism and police brutality. Of course, my Trump bro's been a cop and he doesn't believe that there's police brutality or systemic racism. I don't know. Did he come from the same family? I, I, I don't know. He is the baby in the, in the family. And apparently we didn't teach him well enough when he was growing up. Had too much time on his own with his friends. Reed signing was a significant move, not just because the Panthers were desperate for talent in their defensive backfield after a rash of injuries. Reed has joined Kaepernick in a collusion lawsuit against the NFL, which alleges that NFL owners conspired to keep the two former San Francisco 49ers off the field because of their protest activities. Kaepernick should be playing for the Niners right now since they have a couple of hurt quarterbacks. At his first press conference in Charlotte on Monday, Reed made it clear that his time away from the field had neither muted his desire to fight injustice nor scared away nor scared him away from speaking his mind. And uh, but the most powerful part of the press conference came when a reporter asked him why he felt compelled to continue to be an outspoken critic of racism in America, despite the career consequences he believes he has faced as a result. Next year will be 2019, Reed said. It will mark 400 years since the first slaves touched the soil of this country. That's 400 years of systemic oppression. 
That's slavery, Jim Crow, new Jim Crow, mass incarceration, you name it, the Great Depression. They come out with a new deal, and black people didn't have access to those government stimulus packages. The new deal set up what is known as the modern-day middle class. We didn't have access to those programs, the GI Bill, Social Security, home loans, none of that. So this has been happening since my people have gotten here, and so I just felt the need to say something about it. How dare you? You're getting a paycheck. Yeah. Does being a a, a worker mean that that you're just a wage slave? No, we're more than just wage slaves. We're Americans. Come on. In this reporter's opinion. Well, this is a powerful message to deliver to reporters in North and South Carolina, considering both states voted for Trump. And it's a statement that no Carolina Panther would have likely given a year ago. Jerry Richardson, the former owner of the Panthers, was notoriously conservative and controlling. But he was forced to sell the team last year after a Sports Illustrated report and subsequent NFL investigation revealed a disturbing history of sexism, harassment, and racism in the workplace. So I guess... uh, public opinion can have an effect on the marketplace. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles rester Toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Luke Barnes, also of Think Progress, brings us this last offering here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Prosecutors in the eastern German city of Chemnitz say they have arrested six men on suspicion of plotting attacks against foreigners and politicians. And that announcement comes weeks after a series of violent far-right rallies rocked the city. You know, the Germans don't really believe neo-Nazis have a few fine people among their midst. And that they have, well, you know, uh, uh, a right uh, to to command the public square. In fact, there are laws that prevent them from doing exactly that. But this is worse. The men uh, are alleged to have formed a group called Revolution Chemnitz and uh, been part of the skinhead hooligan and neo-Nazi scenes in and around the city. The suspects were planning to procure semi-automatic weapons aimed to overthrow the rule of law and democracy because democracy is, you know, pluralistic and you have a lot of those mud people involved like they can have like a choice in how we all live. More than 100 officers were involved in the arrests in Chemnitz, the state of Saxony and Bavaria. The seventh member of the group was arrested earlier this month. Five of the men had previously carried out attacks on migrants earlier in September, including hitting a migrant over the head with a bottle. Chemnitz has been at the center of the far-right violence in Germany since late August, when the death of a German man allegedly at the hands of two migrants sparked violent far-right protests. Demonstrators uh, were alleged to have attacked anyone in the city center who did not look German. While in other incidents, police stood by while protesters performed the Nazi salute, which is illegal in Germany. And I should add, those cops who stood by were uh, punished. Perhaps more worryingly, the head of Germany's domestic intelligence agency was forced to step down in mid-September after questioning the authenticity of some videos showing demonstrators hounding migrants. Hans Gug Missen, who headed the Federal Office for the Protection of the Constitution, was moved to the Interior Ministry. Oh, he claimed that Merkel was spreading fake news about the extent of the violence in Chemnitz. 
and he was punished accordingly also. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but that Roots Radio broadcasts on because of all that breaking news that's happening. We're going to visit with you tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Networks Radio for all that breaking news as it's breaking all day and all night. And we will meet up here tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver